Today, I'm going to share with you what I've learned coaching billionaires, people worth hundreds of millions of dollars, people who are the CEOs and founders of billion dollar companies, because I've been coaching them on communication skills and public speaking. And there are patterns of behavior that have emerged that become very common. And there's a lot you can learn about it, not just from a communication perspective, but also to how to carry yourself as someone who's successful and carry yourself as someone who demands a lot of respect in the industry. So let's get right into it. I'm gonna talk about everything from speaking to conversations, to sales, to texting, and you can get an idea of just these patterns and how you can implement them in your life. Now, they're in no particular order of importance. I'm just gonna go over them in the order that I wrote them. The first thing I realized is many of these people, they prefer texting over phone calls. So instead of, getting on a phone with you and talking about things in great detail, usually they will prefer you send it to them in a document or you send it to them via text. They will read it and they will reply quickly. I've had thousands of $25,000 plus contracts being sent my way just through a text conversation. And oftentimes they have an assistant that goes around and they'll have a conversation with me, but rarely will I have someone get on a call with me time and time again just to get intricate details. They just want to know, boil down what it is you offer, what do you do, unless they have specific private concerns, they prefer to talk to you over text or whatever is the shortest medium of communication. Now, number two on that is, because they prefer text, they also prefer shorter durations and shorter bursts of communication. So if they do call you, the calls are very short. They're five minutes while they're in the car or at the airport or waiting somewhere. And they also tend to be very impulsive where, hey, I had five minutes, I'll give you a call, or I've got time at this specific interval, give me a call then. And, and you have to almost catch them in that moment. And if you don't, the next time you catch them might be two weeks later or a month later. So they prefer short, direct styles of communication. And that's why text works really well. Even with email, I've noticed, you won't see, hello, Yasser, thank you so much for sending me this. Really glad that we spoke yesterday. The replies are usually one single sentence or a, a few sentences with minimal, minimal concern for grammar. So maybe this first sentence isn't even capital. It's almost like you pulled out the phone, you type something and you sent it. No full stop, no comma. Sometimes I'll have five sentences back to back with no comma, no full stop. And it, it just shows me that the goal is to send the message as soon as possible, as fast as possible. While you have time to look at the email, you just look at it, you type it out and you send it with very little concern over grammar and specific vocabulary. And the vocabulary is always very, very simple. So it's interesting how the more successful the people that I work with, the more I realize the more direct they are, the less self-conscious they are about vocabulary and they just boil everything down to how can we keep this simple and how can we make this direct? So that was number three, that was number two. Number three is I found them to be very quick decision makers. When they know what they want, they don't waste time. They just go right ahead with it. So for example, when I get on a call with them or when I'm texting them and I'm talking about their issues, if they know in the first five to 10 minutes that I understand their problem, and I can help them, they'll just say, yeah, I just sent the invoice to my marketing manager, just send it to my executive assistant, let me know, I'm free on this day, or send my assistant your calendar, we'll book the first session in. And it's just, okay, I've seen enough, I know I want it, I'll buy it. Whereas I've noticed people who, when I was working with VPs, for example, I was working with mid-level managers, they have to check the budget, they have to do some research, they have to look at 50 different alternatives, see that you're the best one, and then what's the risk of them invest? Of course, because, financially they're not quite there and also there's a lot more risk perhaps they haven't invested in coaching before so when i'm coaching billionaires and people worth a lot of money they have met many people like myself in the past they've met coaches before they've done business transactions before they know what good character looks like and when they see it they don't waste time they make decisions right away and in fact i've seen the opposite problem where i have taken too long to make a decision whether I can help them or not. And they've moved on. They said, hey, listen, you took too long. I just, I want to know who's someone who can help me and get started right away. And when I was early in my career, I was really anxious. I wanted to make sure I could really help them. I didn't want to say something when I couldn't deliver it. And I've lost some deals because of that, just because I did not understand 
that specific client's avatar and their persona of how they communicate. So they're very direct, they make fast decisions, and because of this, they're also quite impulsive. So when they see something they want, they'll just buy it. Or when they, they wanna move ahead with something, they will do it right away. And from a sales perspective, when they give you that green light, that's the time to close the deal then and there. Don't delay it, don't come back next week, don't send them an email and a proposal, just do it then and there, close the deal and then move on. So talked about how they prefer text, brief texts and short calls, they're impulsive and quick decision makers. And by the way, quick caveat, no two, two people are the same. These are just some of the more common traits that I've seen across the board with many of the clients that I work with. So it doesn't have to apply to every single person. Number four, I've realized high net worth individuals have three main things they prioritize when they assess you as, assess your character and assess you as a business vendor. One is trust. Can they trust you? Do you have credibility? Have you done this for other people before? This is huge because they have a big reputation. They don't want to work with someone who doesn't have a good reputation, who's a beginner, who doesn't have any proof that they can deliver the results that they're talking about. Number two, with trust comes certainty. Okay, how certain am I that if I pay this person money, they will give me the result that I want? Actually, it's not even about money. How certain is it that if I spend my time thinking about this person, working with them, they will get me to the result that I want. Because for them, time is more important. I want to make the right decision the first time. So trust, certainty, and number three is speed. How quickly can they get me the result? Do I have to do a whole lot of work myself? Is it inconvenient? Can they do it for me? So for example, with presentations, no CEO wants to sit down and make their own slides unless only they can talk about the material. They say, hey, here's everything I want to talk about. Can the slides get done? Can you just consult me on what to move around and I'll tell my assistant to do it? Can you tell me how to make this memorable? Just save me the time, make this as efficient as possible. The more you're willing to do for them, the easier it makes their life, the easier it is for them to work with you. And the more, Guy Kawasaki told me this, he said, the more irreplaceable and the more, what's the word I'm looking for here? I forget the word, but he, he said, you can't be replaceable if they need you. And if you make their life significantly easier, then they'll have reason to continue working with you. So that's number four, speed, trust, and certainty. Deliver on that wherever you can. If you make a promise, deliver on the promise. Don't make promises you can't keep. Don't overpromise. just tell them how it is. Number five, when it comes to sales tactics, Many of the sales tactics that you might use to, if you have a business that is, or if you try to convince them or persuade them, they will see right through it. So if you say, I only have two slots left and you better buy now, pull out your credit card, that's not going to work on these ultra high net worth individuals. They know they have options. They know they can look elsewhere. They know all the sales tricks in the book. So they don't really fall for them as much. And in fact, if you've done a good job of earning their trust so far and then you pull out some of these sales tactics, instantly you disintegrate all of the trust you've built and they'll say, nope, nope, that I've literally had this where I, I was trying some sales tactics with them and they said, yeah, so you're trying too hard. I'm sorry, it's not going to work. And that was it. I haven't heard from them since and it's my fault because I was not trained at the time. I did not understand the avatar of the client. But this is the reality. They've had enough of these conversations. They've met enough salespeople. They've been met enough high performers to know who's going to deliver, who really needs to convince you, as opposed to someone who's done it enough times where they don't even need to use these sale tactics. So that's number five. Number six is money conversations or money in general. Again, this is the context of a business conversation is less important than your ability to articulate how likely you are to deliver results. So they won't ask you questions about, hey, why do you charge $25,000? Can we do 20,000? Can we do 22,000? They won't ask you that as much as they will ask you, hey, I want to make sure my time is well spent. I'm okay spending the 25, 50 grand, that's all right. But if you and I work together, Yasser, I want to make sure I get these results. I want to make sure you'll be on time. I want to make sure you'll be watching my videos, giving me feedback. I want to make sure before I go on this interview that you have given me all the tools, you have helped me rehearse. Can we be sure of that? So when I'm coaching clients and I'm getting, a call, getting on a call with a, a prospective clients, 
if there's any mention of discount, can you lower the rates, anything like that, usually it tells me they're not an ideal fit for me because my ideal client, when I tell them, hey, it's 25,000, 30,000, 45,000, they don't even bat an eye. Like, okay, great, that, that's fine, whatever, send it to my assistant, but really let's, let's get back to what I need. They're willing to pay for certainty. And when your prices are higher, by the way, they're a lot more likely to believe that you can deliver it. So I'll give you a great example. One of my clients that I am allowed to talk about, I can't say her exact net worth because I don't know, but it's probably nine figures, but uh, Shannon Klingman, the founder of Lumi Deodorant, one of the best clients I've ever had the pleasure of working with. I remember when I was working with her, I was completely full on clients and I did not want to take her on just because I was full. I didn't have any capacity. And when I was on the phone with her, my assistant coach talked to her first and said, hey, Yasser, you talk to her. She's amazing. You have to talk to her. I got on a call with her and I just wanted her to not work with me. So I said, hey, just so you know, I charge $5,000 a month, like, just so you know. And I was hoping she would say, oh, that's a little too expensive. I don't care. And the thing she said after that still sits rent free in my brain. And you know what she said? She said, that's it. Two words, that's it. She was shocked at my rates. And then she said, do you do this full time? Is this your side thing? And, and I'm, I'm just, what, what's going on here? $5,000 is a lot of money for every single client I work with. But the thing is, for these people, that's not a lot of money. They're looking for world class and they expect world class prices too. So sometimes you might be the best at your job, but if you price yourself too low, which I certainly was, they won't take you seriously. So for them, it's more important to get the result than to get a discount. So for me, an indicator of someone who's not an ideal client is whether they ask for a discount right away, whether they start negotiating prices right away. My best clients have never done that. I've never needed to. My prices are on the website. So that just tells me right away that they're going to be good clients. Okay, so that was number six, that the money conversations are less important. Number seven, don't be overly enthusiastic. Now, this is strange. If I'm, if I'm talking to them and I want them to believe me and I want to persuade them that I can help them with their public speaking, and if I say, oh, you know what I'll do with you? On week one, we're going to work on your speaking structure. Week two, we're going to work on how to open your speech. Then week three, we're going to work on this and that and this and that, and I'm really excited that I can help you. That is an instant turnoff for them because what that communicates is neediness and eagerness. You're so excited about their business because you haven't gotten business before. If you got on 10 calls like that a day, every single day, by the time you talk to them, you've had these conversations so many times that your tone almost becomes a matter of fact. So for example, if you go to a doctor and you say, hey doctor, and this is a real example, I have really dry mouth when I'm public speaking. What do I do? And the doctor says, you know what? You should take this spray. When you use this spray, automatically, it will rapidly moisturize and soothe in your mouth and it will help you speak really well. So you should take two of these and then and tell me how it goes. If a doctor spoke to you like that, you would be immediately skeptical. What is this person trying to sell me? Why are they so enthusiastic? But if the doctor listened to me and says, okay, if you have dry mouth, Something that's worked in the past for some of the other patients that I had is this little thing here. You spray it in your mouth twice and it lasts for about an hour and a half and it keeps your mouth pretty, pretty moist. Try this out for a week and see how that works out. Can you see how the tonality was so flat? Now, when we think about public speaking, we think about, oh, I have to be energetic and enthusiastic. But when you're an expert, you have to speak with conviction and stability. You have to talk almost in a flat way where, yeah, I've had this conversation so many times that this is just how it is. So if I asked you an obvious question, like, do you know your ABCs? You would say something like, yeah, of course I know my ABCs, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. You would just say it automatically. And when someone's really good at their job, they don't need the extra enthusiasm. They can just communicate directly, concisely, without enthusiasm. Some people say, oh, if he doesn't have enthusiasm, they're not a good speaker. No. They don't have enthusiasm. Maybe they're just really good at what they do. And they've had that conversation a million times. So that was an interesting and surprising observation for me. Number eight, act like them and challenge them. I made this mistake that when I used to speak to people who were 
let's say ranked above me, they were making more money than me, they had a big company, they were multimillionaires, billion dollar companies, I would get intimidated and I would almost talk to them like I'm a fan. Where, oh, I don't wanna lose your business, and how about we try this, let's try a little bit of that. Oh, you don't like this coaching approach, let me try this. Oh, you don't wanna do practice, okay, let's not do practice, let's do this instead. I would start catering to them, and I realized then the relationship them and I had wasn't a one-to-one -one relationship. It felt like they were better than me and they wouldn't really listen to what I was saying. And therefore, I did not have a lot of influence on them. So what I had to do is I had to act like them. When I came onto the calls, I had to act like I had 10 other people just like them or more successful than them that I'm coaching and they're just another one of those people. That I'm completely used to that. Now initially this was very hard to do because I just did not have that kind of clientele. I was working with students first, then I was working with entry level professionals and managers and VPs and founders, now ultra high net worth individuals, but now I've worked with enough of them that I know how to speak to them. I know I'm not intimidated. I know at the end of the day they have insecurities. I know they're thinking about whether their team respects them, when they're on stage, will they appear correct? I know all of their insecurities because I've coached enough of them. So when I get on the call with them, I don't have imposter syndrome anymore. I don't feel like I have to qualify myself. Instead, I talk to them as if they're at the same frequency as I am and I will challenge them. So if some founder comes in and, and if I had this happen where I had a founder who said, hey, I just wanna practice twice a month and I wanna get world-class at public speaking. And I said, listen, if that's your, if you wanna practice for half an hour twice a month and you wanna to get to a world-class level, I'm probably not the best coach for you. In fact, I'm not even sure who to recommend to you because if you want to get world-class results, you need to put in world-class effort. And I don't think half an hour or an hour a month is gonna do that, am I wrong? And just by verbalizing that, just by calling them on their limitations, you would earn their trust. And they say, oh, okay, I'm glad you didn't just roll over. And here's the other thing. Many people in their team don't tell them how it is because they're afraid to lose their job. Like, oh, if I tell them they're not speaking correctly or they're really boring, they're really monotone, I will look bad, they won't like me, I, like, I might lose my job. But when someone like me comes in and I just tell it to them as it is, so for example, I was talking to this one tech, tech founder, humongous company, just gigantic, and he said, I'm a really, really good public speaker, I just need help with getting my introductions and my conclusions down. If I can do that, I'm good. I said, great. And as he's speaking to me, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, like, uh, um, and then I asked him, do you think there's anything in your delivery that needs work? He said, no, 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 I'm not really concerned about delivery. I've been told I'm a great public speaker. It's just the opening and the ending. And then I showed him our conversation, the recording of it, and I replayed it. And I just said, watch this and tell me what your initial impressions are about you speaking. And then he said, I didn't notice I said, I'm in a, that many times. And I said, yeah, that's what I noticed too. Do you think there might be other blind spots like that that you also are not noticing? So notice how I'm challenging their beliefs. And when you do that, you unlock a belief in their mind and then they start to trust you. So don't be intimidated. Don't treat them like they're above you act like them, and also don't do the opposite. Don't pretend like you're better than them. You also don't wanna do that. Hey, I can train you, I've trained all these other people, this will be a piece of cake. Don't do that. Be realistic, earn their trust, and if you can give them any damaging admissions, also do that. So hey, I had one person who came to me, he said, Yasser, I've got a stutter, very successful executive, but I, I stutter all the time. How do I overcome my stutter? I tried some techniques on him, but I realized, hey, I, I don't think this is a speech problem, this might be some sort of a mental issue, get it checked out. They went to a speech pathologist and they sure enough said, hey, there's some mental areas we can work on. So if I had just tried to fix this problem and it didn't work, do you think he would say good things about me? No, so it's better to be transparent and tell them about the things you can't do because that way they'll earn your trust or you'll earn their trust. Number nine, everything is about efficiency. How can we make it as efficient as possible? How can we take less time to do the thing? How can we take less time to communicate? How can we have less meetings? How can we text less? Everything is less and also efficiency in terms of how they communicate. So many of the founders that I have, they will communicate via voice message just because it's faster to press a button, say their thoughts out loud, and they will receive responses via text because it's easier to read the text. But if I send them a five minute long voice recording, they're not just gonna sit there and listen to all five minutes. It takes too long. 
So they prefer reading it and they prefer saying the voice messages. Other people I've seen, they prefer short texts. They just text the thing and I text it back. Very, very short messages, but very, very frequently, that tends to work much better for them. So how can we be as efficient with our communication as possible? Number 10, there's a high degree of implementation when you work with people at that level. By implementation, I mean, when I'm coaching them, they do not take time to assess the feedback I've given to see if it's right or wrong. They just do it and find out. So for example, I had a client of mine who he wanted to start his presentation the way most people do. Hey, my name is this. This is our agenda. We're going to talk about point one, point two, point three. And I told him, listen, this is very boring. It, everyone else on your team is going to do the exact same thing. It's not going to stand out. You're going to be forgettable. So instead, what I want you to do is start with a hook and go into a story and then introduce the agenda. And he said, well, in our company, we don't really do this, blah, 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 blah. I said, that's completely fine. Run it by five people on your team and see what they say. He said, sure. Next day, he put his team in a room and said, hey, here's what I'm thinking. What do you think of the speech opening? All five of them said that was infinitely better than the agenda. Do that instead. So what he did was he took my feedback. He still asked people he trusted because they had more context of his job implemented it right away, found out right away, trusted me more, and then every time he, I gave him recommendations after that, he trusted them that much faster. So they don't, they, they're not on the fence for very long. If I give them feedback, they just take it point, point, face value. They don't try to argue with it. Oh, actually, I should, I should do this. I should do this. Let me challenge you on that. If they have general concerns over it, they will voice it, obviously, but they come from a place of, I'm open. Just tell me what you think. I respect your perspective. Even if I don't take on the perspective, just tell me what you think. They value that directness. And if you're someone who works for one of these CEOs, maybe they're not your clients, but you're an employee, I guarantee you, if you're just direct and you tell them what you truly think, they will respect you more than anybody else. I had a, the only job that I've ever worked in. I had a CEO who had a executive assistant who was half his height and she would boss him around like hey where are you going why are you going for lunch now you have a meeting in 45 minutes you're not going to be back on time read this document that i'm going to send you get up to date on what they need and then go into the meeting she would boss him around and he trusted her because he knew she knew his schedule better than he did she knew how he should conduct him himself better than he did. So you need to be that kind of person for these people. You need to be someone who opens their mouth, shares their opinion, and you are valuable and visible. You don't wanna be that person who's completely invisible. If you're completely invisible and they find out that one day you've been let go or that you don't even exist and you got fired, they'll think, well, I don't even know who that person was. It doesn't really matter if they got fired because you were never visible. So your job is to be as visible as much as you can and that's going to give you a place at the table. Number 11. Now, this is coming back to public speaking coaching and public speaking tips. Many of these people, they do not have a fear of public speaking. Now, if you look at a lot of the public speaking coaches out there, their tagline is, I'll train you how to overcome the fear of public speaking, conquer the stage and overcome public speaking, how not to be. These people are not afraid of public speaking. They have been on stage time and time again. They have an entire company they speak in front of several times a week. They go to investors. They've done this before, but they do have a fear of not appearing credible. Meaning, when I'm standing in front of a thousand people, when I'm speaking to my investors, I want to make sure they take me seriously. So their goal is based on the audience. I want the audience to react a certain way. When I speak, I want them to feel this about my story, about my product. I want them to feel confident about what I'm delivering today. So it's all about the audience. Whereas I feel when I'm training my students in my membership, their students, their early professionals, they're more thinking about themselves. Where, how do I look more confident? How do I feel better? How do I conquer my anxiety? How do I use the right? It's all about me, 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 me. It's not about the audience. So the more you grow up the ladder, the more successful you get, the more it becomes important about how are other people responding to my message. If I have filler words, that's okay. If I don't have the best story, that's okay. Did my message get across? Did I serve the people today? Did they feel confidence in my product and solution? Did my team feel motivated? They're always focused 
on the audience. And that's a very mature thing. Not a lot of people have that. So at that level, public speaking anxiety is not their main concern. It's more so making the audience feel and think about what they're intending them to feel or think about. Number 12, they have a very short time frame where they allow you to prove yourself. So if I, if I don't have a good first impression with them, if I'm not on time for the calls, or I don't give them feedback right away, that's good. If I didn't do what I told them to do, I will lose trust with them very quickly. And it's rare to get a second chance with these people. Because again, you, when you're a very high net worth individual, you have access to tons of people, tons of referrals. You can send one message. Hey, who's the best media trainer? Who's the best public speaking coach? Send them my way and you'll get it right away. So they don't want to waste time, especially if you've given them something negative to focus on. So you don't get a lot of time to get their attention. And also, if you are trying to book a meeting with them, you will only catch them in certain places. And when you catch them, you have to make a good impression right away. So oftentimes you've got to be ready last minute. So sometimes you'll have, Hey, I've got five minutes now. Are you available? And you might be at the gym. So you might need to go leave the gym, get on a call. I've had this happen many, many times where I'm literally at the gym. I got a call by someone's assistant. Hey, he's available in five minutes. Can you make it? And I just ran back from my gym and I got on a call with him. I didn't have time to prepare for the meeting, but because I've done it enough times, I was able to get on a call and talk to them about it. So they give you a very, very short window to both access them and prove your worth. Number 13, which is they command respect and love from their team. Now, this is something that I learned from another clients of mine. Uh, Hussein Salem from Abu Dhabi. He's a real estate developer. He is the CEO of Ohana Development, one of the best clients that I've ever worked with. He flew me out to Abu Dhabi for one of his speeches and a huge event. There were all kinds of real estate billionaires, influential people, models, God knows what. And every single person there was following him around. And I was observing how he carried himself. He didn't have this, oh, I'm so charismatic but he had this loving, graceful way of carrying himself where he cared about every single person he met, whether it's the person taking care of the event, whether it's his assistant, whether it's some real estate developer, whether it's some influencer, he would treat them all the same way. And you know what really stuck out to me? When his speech ended, you had all these world-renowned celebrities on stage with him, taking pictures, and the event was wrapping up, it was slowing down. He brought me on stage and in front of Everyone around him, he said, Yasser, I appreciate you flying down here, helping me last minute with this speech. I really appreciate you. He shook my hand. We took a photo and you can still find the photo on my Instagram or my LinkedIn. And I got emotional. I got emotional because of how he made me feel in that moment. And he taught me a lesson. People at that level, they command respect. They command love from their team. They're not selfish. They want their team to see them as a role model. They conduct themselves in a way that inspires their team. And you, another the client that I mentioned, Shannon, she has the same thing too. Her team loves her because of how much she pours herself into the business, into the team. And you can tell they're not selfish. They will go above and beyond for the people on their team. So having this not charisma so you can have other people say, wow, this person's so charismatic, they're so confident, but charisma in the sense that they want other people around them to feel good in their company. So how can you do that? When you're around people, do people feel better about themselves? Do you make them feel better being in your company? Or do they feel worse being around you because you keep talking about yourself and your accomplishments? And I've been guilty of that too. I'll be the first one to admit that. But that was a very, very important reminder for me. Number 14 is that when you're working with people at that level, they're also a lot more willing to talk about you to other high net worth people. So I'll give you an example. I was working with, I can't name the person, but an extremely successful YouTube celebrity. And he was in the finance niche. And if I told you the name, you would know it immediately. And after our first two sessions, he immediately had three WhatsApp group chats with three of his other people. He said, hey, this is Yasser. He's helping me with my speaking. He's amazing. Book a call with him and hire him right away. So because you work with these people at the higher level, 
they have a much broader network. When they see your value, they know a lot other, a lot more people who can see your value and then they recommend you to them. And this ends up being beneficial for you because now you're working with high level people, you're getting them better results because if they've achieved this much success in business, they're more likely to achieve this much success in speaking or fitness or whatever it is that you might be coaching them on. And at the same time, they also have a network of other successful people that they will then recommend you to. So it's a, it's a triple quadruple whammy here where better results, more pay, more referrals, and it just grows your business much faster. And I realized this when I was working with VPs, many of them, sure, they had some referral power, but because they were still employees, many times they didn't have a whole lot of referral power. But when someone's a business owner, they can just say, hey, this is my business. He helped my business. He can help your business too. He can help this person's business too. Let me introduce you to Yasser because I know Yasser can help you. You're my friend. You have a business. Yasser can help you. So now they will give you more referrals. And I didn't know about this, but the better the client, the more sophisticated and successful the client, the more referrals they will give you. Number 15, I'm going to wrap up with this one. I've got a lot more of these. So if you're enjoying this, let me know in the comments. This is a bit of an, a tangent of a topic, but I thought it might be interesting. Number 15 is they communicate through action, meaning things that they do will rub off on you. Things they do will rub off on you. Sounds actually kind of smart. Let me write that down somewhere. I'll trademark it. But I have learned more from these CEOs, founders, billionaires by just being around them then by what they have told me, by seeing how they conduct their life, how they manage their time, how they think about their vision. So I'll give you the examples that yeah, I mentioned earlier. So Hussein Salam, he is preparing a property in Abu Dhabi right now that it's going to be an iconic property in Abu Dhabi. It's going to be recognizable in Abu Dhabi when you come in there. And he had that vision for that property since he was a child. He used to watch this show called Mega Structures as a Child on National Geographic, where they would show you how some of these biggest sky skyscrapers are built. And he said, one day, I'm going to build something like that. And he had that vision for himself up until it happened. And when I went to help him with the speech, his speech was for the inaugural event of that building. So when I talked to him, I said, hey, how are you able to do these things? And he says, Yasser, my vision of the future has to be much bigger than what I think is possible. So if I think I can do this, I have to convince myself to set my vision up here. And I heard the same exact thing from Shannon. So Shannon, if you don't know her story, she started a full body deodorant company. It was the first full body deodorant in the world. There were no full body deodorants before that, but she had a personal hygiene issue. She had a problem with that. So she relentlessly pursued the journey to create that product. She created it, tested it, put all of her money into that business, took money out of her retirement savings, re refinanced her house, everything, relentlessly chased it because she knew she was going to be successful. She didn't have any reason to believe it, but in her mind, it had already happened. The vision of their future was so much bigger than what they have already accomplished. And this is what I learned from them. I learned from them through their actions and how they talked about their life, how they carried themselves. So when I meet them, I come back and I think, man, I have to think bigger about my life. I have to have a much bigger vision. Why do I get on some calls and I think, oh, I can't charge this much or this person's not going to pay for this much. I'm not worth this much money. But then when I talk to these people and they say, oh, you absolutely can. In fact, Shannon, she spent an hour and a half just convincing me to triple my rates and I said, Shannon, no one's going to pay that much money. And then she said, just say it to the next person. And I said it, and sure enough, they said, yeah, that's no problem. Let's do it. And my prices have never gone down since. So it showed me that I had limiting beliefs. So when you are around people who are ultra high net worth, not only are they ultra high net worth, but to get to that level, they've had to make leaps in their mindset and in their beliefs that get them to that level. And when you spend time around them, those beliefs will start to rub off on you. The way they communicate their future, the way they communicate their vision, that will rub off on you. So the higher quality people you surround yourself with, 
the higher quality of life you will have. I have realized this time and time again. This is why I really enjoy working with this subsector of people, people who are ultra successful, who only want the best. Those are the types of clients that I enjoy working with. So these were the 15 things that I have learned coaching billionaires, 100 millionaires, highly, highly, highly successful, super ultra high net worth people. I hope this is valuable to you and I hope this makes you a better communicator.